All right, so today's reading is going to be Matthew chapter 3, and this verse can be found on page 967 of the Church Bibles. The Baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, who I, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and sent him on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went, to, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Nephtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen the great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Thanks, Ella, for uh, reading that passage to us. Let me up my welcome to Pete. It's great to see you here. If you don't know me, my name's Mark. I'm one of the ministers here. And as Pete said, this is a special weekend. Uh, we've been meeting together as a church family yesterday and today, thinking about this issue of our humanity and our identity and who are we um, fundamentally as human beings. Um, if you weren't here yesterday, I should just point out that we have this booklet. There's one at the back, so do take one of those if you want to. Um, there's some, some notes in here where you can uh, follow along. Although I don't need that, points will be up on the uh, screen as uh, well. Um, let me pray for us um, before we have a look at this passage together. Father God, thank you that you are a speaking God. Uh, we saw that yesterday in session one in the creation account. Uh, you spoke and things happened and you continue to speak to us today through the preaching of your word. And so I pray, Father, that we would meet with you afresh this morning. You would help us to hear your voice, what you are saying to each of us personally, intimately, in all the different aspects of our life. And we would believe what you are going to say. We would trust your word and we would shape our lives around it. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, look, if you weren't here, let me just say briefly that yesterday in session one, um, we looked at the nature of humanity and what it means for us to be made in the image of God. God who himself has inestimable, infinite worth. And so for him to imprint upon our souls and bodies his own image means we have inherent value and worth. And we saw that to be made in the image of God is to be made in these three areas of life, that we are worshipping beings, we're made to worship God. We are knowing beings, to know his story for life. And we are making beings, making homes, making livings, living all of our life to him, for him, through him. That was session one, the nature of humanity. We find our identity there in the blessing of a God-given one, how he determines us to be. 
But then we looked in the second session in the afternoon at the corruption of humanity and how tragically our sin, our turning away from God, corrupts us at the very core of our being. And in these three areas, sin corrupts our worship. We worship created things instead of him. We love other things too much rather than him. It corrupts our knowing. We start believing lies and other stories, alternative realities, which are just not true. And ultimately, it corrupts our uh, making. And we are left in a pretty serious situation because God is angry with the way we have treated him in trying to build our own identities on created things rather than him. So that was uh, yesterday. Today, in session three, it's more upbeat. Today now, we come to the perfect human. We come to the ideal vision um, of humanity. It's worth pointing out as we start uh, this topic uh, this morning, just some of the, to think about some of the competing visions of humanity that are out there that culture is uh, saying to us, to this is the ideal, this is the goal, this is what you should be going after. For example, I've written down a few here. A networked humanity. Think social media. A liked humanity. Facebook. A knowledgeable humanity. Google. A conversant humanity. Twitter. A common humanity with no ethnic differences. Cosmopolitanism. Multiple humanities with competing differences. Nationalism. A free to choose. Fluid humanity. Transgenderism. An augmented humanity through technology. Transhumanism. To name just a few. All these competing visions, ideals for humanity. This is what you should go after. This is what you should live for. This is who you should be. And I suppose the question for us this morning is, well, you know, which one of them is true? If any are true, do we pick one of them, some of them, none of them? Is there even a perfect ideal, a perfect human being? Now, of course, from the Christian point of view, the answer is yes, his name is Jesus Christ. And what we're going to see in the Bible this morning is how Jesus perfectly worships God, perfectly knows God and his way, and perfectly does the work of God. He's the perfect human being, homo adorans, homo sapiens, homo faber. He is the vision. He is the ideal. He is the one we should be going after. He is the goal. So let's look at each of these in turn under our first point, Jesus, the perfect human. And within this, his perfect worship. Have a look down at verse 13 on page 967 if you've closed your Bibles. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. So here is Jesus Christ, is about to start his public ministry, and he comes to John to be baptized. And John's like, no, 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 <laughs> you got it wrong, Jesus. It's the other way around. Like, I need to baptize you. Um, you're the Messiah, not me. Um, you're the one we've been waiting for, not me. Um, I'm the one who is the failed human being, not you. Please, would you baptize me? I'm not even worthy to carry your sandals, let alone baptize you. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Let it be so. This must be done to fulfill all righteousness. Why does Jesus say that? Because here is a human being who does perfectly worship God. A human being where you look at Jesus and you get to the heart of who he is, what really makes him tick, what drives him, what is his fundamental orientation and his first love, it is to God. And his ways, his righteousness, we see it Jesus in all of his life, whether it is his work, whether it is his family, whether it is appreciation of taste and beauty, whether it's his baptism here, whatever he's doing in any moment of life, I want to fulfill all righteousness, all of it, not some of it, not just when it suits me, all the time, all righteousness. He loves God with every fiber of his being, his heart, his mind, his soul, his strength. You think of Jesus' life, the way he talked to the Father, Listen to the Father, 
sang to the Father. By age 12, people were already marveling at him in the temple because of his knowledge and grasp of the scriptures and his knowledge of God. No matter how busy Jesus was, he never forgot to be talking, depending to his God in prayer. Jesus is the perfect example of humble submission to the Father. He says, I do nothing of my own initiative. That's John chapter 8, 28. But just as the Father taught me, I speak these things. I always do what pleases him. So much so, Jesus is even obedient to death and death on the cross. Because his whole life, his heart, his passion, the orientation of everything that he is to God and to his way, to his righteousness. Now, let's pause here for a moment in case we miss the significance of this. Jesus did nothing of his own initiative. Does that take you by surprise at all? Here is Jesus. He is the Son of God. Surely he can do whatever he likes, whenever he likes. Surely he can be whoever he wants to be. He created this, and through him all things were created. I do nothing of my own initiative. Because Jesus knows, in his humanity, that life and freedom and flourishing, life to the full, these things only come through worship of God and living all of life for God and through him, his perfect worship of God. And a voice from heaven says, verse 17, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Now, is there anything better in life than this? to have the one person who matters in the universe, the one person whose opinion accounts to affirm you like this. I love you. I am well pleased with you. An unconditional, uh, infinite love and acceptance. Can you imagine God saying that about you? Jesus' perfect worship of God. Secondly, his perfect knowledge of God and his ways. Because as we've been seeing over this weekend, the second part of our humanity, fundamentally worshipping beings, but that plays itself out in us being knowing beings and knowing God's story and the stories we tell each other and the narratives and culture or from friends that we follow. And again, Jesus does this perfectly. Look at him here in verses 1 to 11 of chapter 4 with the devil. Three times the devil tries to sell Jesus an alternative vision for life, an alternative story. And in all three times, Jesus says, no, that is not the true story. No matter how tempting it is, Scripture tells me the true story of my life. First one. If you are the Son of God, verse 3, tell these stones to become bread. We're told in verse 2, Jesus is hungry. He's been fasting for 40 days. The devil tempts him. You're hungry. God's not provided. Take matters into your own hands. You're still single. God's not provided. Take matters into your own hands. And Jesus says, no, that is not the true story. The true story is, man, woman, shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. God is who I need. God will sustain me. God will provide for me. All I need, when I need, that is the true story. Second temptation. Devil goes for scripture this time, gives an alternative interpretation of scripture quote Psalm 91 that says he will lift you up, God will lift you up, so if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. Scripture says God is love, so surely I can love whoever I want. And for Jesus' temptation, he says, no, this is not the true story. Scripture tells me the true story. 
do not put the Lord your God to the test. And Scripture tells us the true story when it comes to love, true fault, true love, false love, who we can and we cannot uh, love. Finally, third temptation, the devil offers Jesus everything. <laughs> now, all the kingdoms of the world, their splendor, if only Jesus gives himself to the devil. All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. But Jesus responds, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Because as we've been seeing over and over this weekend, life meaning purpose, satisfaction, who we are, our humanity, our identity, can ultimately only be found in worship of God himself, our creator. Scripture tells me the true story. We must worship God alone. And notice, by the way, the devil tempts Jesus in all three aspects of our humanity. First, our making. Secondly, knowledge, Scripture. Thirdly, worship. But Jesus is so saturated with Scripture, so lives and breathes God's Word, that whatever he is tempted with, in any situation, in all of life, he knows exactly what to do. He knows God's story. He knows how to respond to the temptations of the devil. He knows the overarching narrative of his life. There's nothing that can tempt him away from it. Now, can you imagine how reassuring that must be in life, to whatever situation you face, you knew what to do. You knew what was right and what was wrong, what was true and what was just partially true. To listen to the stories and narratives that culture around us tell us and to know which ones are lies and to be rejected and which ones are from God and should be followed. If only we knew our scriptures better. If only we trusted God's word more. Because that's what Jesus did and he did it perfectly. His perfect worship, his perfect knowledge. Also, his perfect at work. At the third aspect of being a human, we've been saying, we are makers, we make homes, we make a living. And um, Jesus does this perfectly too. Not that Jesus had his own family, Jesus never got married. So there is nothing wrong inherently with singleness, let's be clear on that. But Jesus did have relationships, did make a lot of relationships, did make a spiritual family. Whoever does my will, they are my mothers, my brothers, my sisters. Jesus called the church family the one true family on earth. As for his work, his main work was to do the works of the Father. And we see him here in verse 14, fulfilling scripture through the prophet Isaiah, verse 17, preaching the kingdom of heaven. Although he didn't start this until age 30, right? He was a carpenter for most of his life. A small little detail, but a significant one. Because Jesus lived the full breadth of humanity. He was used to the day-to-day -day going to work. Coming back home. The normal day-to-day -day working pattern. Now, when we think of Jesus' main work, we tend to go straight to his work of redemption. But let's not forget his work of incarnation. You can't have one without the other. And the life Jesus lived, the way he loved people, the way he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. The way he never treated anyone with lack of grace, the way he never got unduly angry. The way he was patient, no matter the pressure he was under, the way he forgave his enemies. The way he is the perfect truth teller. Jesus, the most beautiful of lives lived. Jesus, the most compelling of people, of persons. Was it Einstein who called Jesus the luminous Nazarene for the way Jesus lit up history and continues to light up history today? If only our lives were more like Jesus. Imagine what the world would be like if we lived lives more like him, the perfect human. But we don't. And we can't. We don't and we can't because of what we saw yesterday with the corruption of humanity and the way our sin turns us away from God and our sin corrupts our worship. We love the wrong things, corrupts our knowledge. We follow the wrong stories, corrupts our making. Everything we're doing ultimately is not for God. And we can't escape and we can't get out. 
And do you remember at the end? We saw God's angry with us about it too. Well, look, we have failed in our image of God. It is tarnished, it is broken, we have angered God, we need forgiveness, we need restoration. But the good news of Christianity is that Jesus came to earth not just to be an example for us to follow, but first and foremost, a saviour to believe in. He is not just the perfect human, he is the perfect restorer of humanity. That's the second thing for us to see. I don't know if you came across a story a few years back about um, Cecilia Gimenez. She is an 80-year-old pensioner um, near Zaragoza, and um, she was pretty upset at the way one of the paintings of Jesus in her precious church had deteriorated over time, and she took it upon herself to restore this image of Jesus, this fresco. Now, apparently she asked the priest about it. Apparently the priest thought this woman knew what she was doing. (laughs) And people got a shock. Let me show you what the image, how it had deteriorated. So there we are, there's the fresco of um, Jesus, and of course it needs to be restored. Um, People got a shock when um, she finished her restoration project. Uh, Someone described it as a crayon sketch of a very hairy monkey in an ill-fitting tunic. (laughs) She's probably putting it kindly. The city councillor said, oh, she had good attentions, but she was clearly out of her depth. I mean, yes, she was. Um, But the reason I tell this story at the start of the second point is, is to say, look, when it comes to us trying to restore our own image, restore our own humanity, we are out of our depth. We might have good intentions. But so corrupted is the humanity now because of sin, we'll make just as mess like she did of that painting. We cannot restore the image of God in us, but Jesus Christ can. He is the perfect restorer of humanity. Not only did Jesus live the perfect life we fail to live, he dies the death that we deserve. And so that if we believe in him, Not only is he treated as we deserve, as he dies in our place on a cross, we are treated as he deserves, and now God can say to us, my son, my daughter, whom I love with you, I am well pleased. That is the heart of the Christian message. That is the heart of the gospel. The wrath of God that we saw yesterday being revealed against all the corruption of humanity, Jesus bears it in our place. Think of all the consequences of our sinful worship, our sinful knowing, our our sinful doing. And Jesus takes it all for us as he dies on the cross. The ultimate shame for all our shame, the ultimate dysphoria of all our dysphorias, The ultimate separation, being torn from his father, whom loved him with an eternal, unbreakable love within the Trinity, and that is broken for all our broken, self-made identities. The love that Jesus Christ has for us, that he would do that for us, is the ultimate frustration of what seems to be a totally wasted life, the perfect human who dies, the ultimate self-isolation of all our selfish individualism. My God, my God, Jesus says, why have you forsaken me? So humanity could be forgiven so humanity could be restored to worship, know, and live for God as was always originally intended. The modern self it is so fragile, as we saw yesterday. The modern self is so fragile because it is based on fragile things. The opinions of others, our own desires, the cultural narratives of the time that shift and wane. Do you see the biblical self is so stable? 
because of the stability of the person it is based upon, God himself, and an unconditional, unbreakable love towards us in Jesus Christ. You trust in him, you always know who you are. You always know who you are. No matter what is going on in your life, no matter what other people say about you, no matter what you think about yourself, no matter what culture says, because you know what God says about you. I love you, I'm well pleased with you. Not because of what you've done, because of what Jesus Christ has done, you are believing in him. Let me finish with two applications. Um, First, behold Jesus' vision for life. We said at the start there are many competing visions for life um, in culture around us, and they're all vying for our attention, they're all vying for our money, and whilst there are some truth in each of these visions, we need to realise at the end of the day they're only partial truths. Uh, Yes, it's good to be networked, networked to each other, ultimately we've got to be networked to God, because everything in life flows from Him. Yes, it's good to be liked Facebooked and liked by other people, But fundamentally, that would be too fragile to base everything on that. We need to be loved by the one person in the universe whose opinion ultimately counts. And yes, Google, it's good to know things, to know this world, to know this material world. It's God's world. Let's discover it. But fundamentally, we are not homo sapiens. We are not knowing people fundamentally. We are homo adorans. We are worshipping people. We need to worship Jesus Christ. And only by worshipping him will we be able to tell and know and identify What is right and wrong with all the cultural narratives and stories and knowledge that is out there in our Google search engine? We need to have Jesus as our fundamental vision for life. Of course, another reason to behold Jesus' vision for life is that he died for us, and neither Facebook nor Google nor any other of these visions will do that for you. They will demand more of you, more time, more attention, more postings, more searchings, more and more for less and less. But there's only one who can restore the very core of who you are, who will die for our flawed self-made identities and give us one that can never be taken away. Behold Jesus. Second application is to seek your identity in Christ. At the end of the day, what matters to us is not what society says about me, looking outside of myself, Not what I say about me, looking inside myself, either to my feelings, my desires, or my achievements, or my successes, but about what God says about me. That in Jesus Christ we are beloved, we are infinitely precious, we are his son and daughter if we are trusting in Jesus Christ. He loves us, he accepts us with an unbreakable, unconditional bond. I am a precious child of God. A Christian identity is not achieved, it is received. Have you done that in Jesus Christ? If you have, stop building. I said to myself, let us stop building our identities on anything other than him. Anything else is too fragile. It will crush us, it will disappoint us, it will let us down. Let us receive, rest in the sure and stable identity that God offers us in Jesus Christ and continue to do it throughout our lives. That is who we're meant to be. Is that who you are? Let me pray that for us now. Let's pray. Father God, thank you very much for the way your word, the Bible, shows us Jesus in all his humanness, fully God but fully human and the perfect human, the way he perfectly worships you, knows you, your story, lives for you in all aspects of life. And thank you so much for the wonderful good news that this is a life lived not just for himself and you but to be given to us as a gift, a life we have failed to live. Thank you, he dies the death we deserve. He removes the wrath, so now we can truly know that you love us unconditionally. Accept us forever if we trust in him. Please give us more of a vision of Jesus. Please help us to seek our identity 
less and less in the things of this world and more and more in the sure and stable love of Jesus Christ and who we are in him. And we ask all this for Jesus' sake. Amen.